Jeremiah chapter 18. Let's look at the setting first. So think through the historical setting of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18 uh, is a, Jeremiah is a, a sixth century prophet. He's writing during the time when the kingdom of Israel has split. They had their united kingdom under the great kings, uh, or the, at least some of the wounded king. They had Saul, David, Solomon. And then the kingdom split with the ten tribes going to the north and being Israel. Two tribes come to the south, and those are known as Judah. So right now, we're at a period of time where the kingdom has split. The ten tribes in the north have been conquered already by the Assyrians in 722. The two tribes to the south um, are still in existence, but they are existence, but they are uh, straying from obedience to Christ. And in their straying, uh, God sends the prophet Jeremiah to confront them, to call them back to the covenant. And as he calls them back to the covenant, he tells uh, uh, Jeremiah a command. He says, "This is the word of the Lord uh, that came to Jeremiah. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord." Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So let's talk about the setting here for a second. Um, when, When he tells Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house, he's challenging him or he's instructing him to leave Jerusalem. Jerusalem's up on a hill. He's at Jerusalem in the temple. Leave Jerusalem, leave the temple area, go down into the Hinnom Valley where the potter's houses were. This is where they would make pottery. So the process, when we think about what we do, uh, when we eat, every time we eat, every time we store something, we have all types of things that we'll store them in. We'll eat off of plates. We'll store things in plastic containers. In the ancient Near East, in the, first, in the, in the 6th century BC, pottery was the name of the game. Uh, this is what they stored everything in. So this is the process of how it would happen. They would go into the ground and get clay out. They would take the clay and they would bring the clay to to the potter's house where he would go through the process of preparing it to turn it into pottery. So the clay would be uh, cleansed. You'd have to remove any stones that were in the clay uh, so that you could get a nice smooth surface. You got to push out any air bubbles. You'd mix it with some water so it's more pliable. Uh, And then they would go through this process of kneading it, getting the air bubbles out, and then uh, shaping it, going through the potter's wheel and shaping it, air drying it, painting it, and then putting it in the oven and baking. So this is where Jeremiah is going to. He's going to the potter's house. Right here we're seeing a a picture of, of a potter that's got the wheel there and he's building the pottery in that place. So Jeremiah goes down and this is what he sees in verse three. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. So he goes down and he sees this potter. And the potter's working on a piece of pottery, but the pottery's messed up. You know, it doesn't go into any details, it's marred. Something's wrong with it. Maybe it's got a hole in it. Maybe it's it's deformed. Maybe it's not smooth. So what does the potter do? Reshapes it puts it all back together, and then starts over again. Starts reshaping it the way that he wants, because nobody's going to want to purchase, if you're a potter, and your business is to sell pottery, you don't, you know, nobody's going to buy a piece of marred pottery from you. It's no good. It's, uh, it's good for nothing but to be broken, or maybe abstract art. So verse 5, he says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Get the connection? He's using a metaphor. You are, he's talking to his his audience, you are like clay in the hand of the potter. So let's unpack this metaphor. Who's the potter? God. Who's the clay? People, what, 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 what uh, in Israel in, the, in, in his setting, but for us, we can expand it out to all of us. So what are the features of clay? Why clay? What, what happens? When you get it, it's malleable. It's impressionable. You can shape it. You can form it. You can add a little water and you can do all types of things to it until you put it in the oven and you bake it and dry it. Then at that point, it's done. But prior to that, 
You can shape it. By the potter can shape it. Now, think through this metaphor. We are the clay. You and I, everybody in here, are like clay. We are impressionable. We are malleable. We can change. We can go from one state to another. We haven't been, we haven't been, uh, you know, uh, God's point to Jeremiah is you haven't been put in the oven already. You're not finished. You can still be shaped. Your lives can change. Your decisions can change. But you got to recognize that Yahweh is the sovereign one. He's the potter. He's sovereignly, sovereignly in control. And he can look down and he can not like what he's seeing. But the good news is that we're still impressionable. Now, let's keep going for a second. In verse uh, 7, this is where he gets to his point. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I were warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. He gives them a basic principle for, for how life works. I might make an announcement, is what God says, that I'm going to take this nation out because they're, they're, they're walking in disobedience and they need to repent and they're not repenting. Uh, so they're, they're going this way. They're in, in, a, in a state of, of disobedience and he's wanting them to repent. And if they repent, then the announcement of judgment that I had declared against them, I will withhold. Now that's great news, because what are we seeing? We're seeing another aspect of who God is. Yes, he is sovereign, but he's also merciful. He's a merciful God that wants his people to repent. How merciful is he? He's sending Jeremiah the prophet to them to tell them, come back to the covenant. It's not too late for you. If you repent, you can still be restored. You're still clay. You're still impressionable. You can change what's going to happen down the road. But you have a responsibility in this, in this uh, decision and what happens even. Now notice what he says in verse 9. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. So we see another aspect of who God is. Yes, he's sovereign. Yes, he's merciful. Yes, he's also just. God can choose to, if, he, if he has proclaimed a blessing upon a nation and that nation chooses to uh, stop obeying him and ends up being disobedient, then he can withhold the blessing that he had promised for them. Now, put that within the context of, of Isaiah's audience. He promised them the land. He promised them blessings. He promised them all types of things, but they're in a state of disobedience. Those promises that I gave you, I can remove. Now, what I want to do is start in the last couple minutes that we have together is look at this truth and then look at it in relationship to our lives. We are the clay. God is the potter. As clay, we are still in a state, if you're still alive, you're still in a state where you can change, where you're impressionable like clay. You can be molded and shaped. So here's the challenge for us. We are being challenged day by day to become more like Christ. We are being challenged day by day to make wise decisions. Every day, students, every single day, you wake up and you have decisions to make. Every day. Now, some of these decisions are real minor. You get up in the morning and you decide whether or not you're going to wear which pair of socks you're going to wear, right? Uh, you have to make a decision, but it's your, you know, it's, it's, that's not a big deal. You're going to decide whether or not on, on, the, on the plate when you go to eat tonight, whether or not you eat your vegetables before you eat your meats or you eat them all together. So every day you make decisions. Some of these decisions are real minor. Some of them are major. For example, let's talk about this. You, you know, perhaps your parents want you to make your bed before you get out of bed every morning. Every morning when you step your foot onto the floor uh, and you have a decision to make, am I going to obey what my parents want me to do and make my bed or do I not? 
Now that's a little bit more serious than am I, what socks am I going to wear? Because now we're going into an issue of obedience versus disobedience. Every time that you go into the classroom, you have choices to make. You know your teachers want certain things out of you or are asking certain things out of you. You have a choice to make whether or not you're going to do it or not. Every Wednesday when you get dressed for chapel, you have a decision to make. Are you going to wear what you're supposed to wear or not? Those are all decisions that have to be made on a day-by-day -day basis. When you're on your phones and Snapchat or whatever the situation may be, you have a decision to make. Am I going to say something encouraging or am I going to say something that's derogatory? In, in, in all of your lives, in your daily lives, you are constantly making decisions. And those decisions become habits. Let me ask you guys a question. We're currently right now in the middle of the Winter Olympics. How does an Olympic athlete get to the Olympics? Somebody said it. Me Megan, what'd you say? You got to go through training, right? You got you to practice. In order to get to the Olympics, you got to qualify for the Olympics. So that means you got to beat other people out. If you're going to beat other people out, you only do that by practicing, by being good at what you're doing. Uh, Mr. Buten here, I'm going to highlight Mr. Buten. Mr. Buten is, uh, I don't know, many of you don't know this, but in the recent days, he uh, found out he was a Grammy Award winner. So, so Mr. Mr. Buten won a, won, was Grammy Award winner for participating in the Houston Symphony and the, the Houston Symphony Award that they, they won the Grammy. So now, in, in order to get onto the Houston Symphony, to get to become a, a, a player in the Houston Symphony, he can't just walk up and say, hey, I want to join. Sign me up. I'm going to play tonight with you. What did he have to do? He had to practice, right? So, so let, me ask, let me ask this. Mr. Buten, how many hours in, your, in the prime of your playing, how many hours a day were you practicing? So between... So between four and ten hours a day, he's practicing. What does that mean? In the, pra in the, in the pattern of practicing, he's getting better and he's, sh he's shaping how well of a, of a player he can be. Your habits are like anything else. Your habits are like a sport. Your habits are like an instrument. You only get good at what you do by practicing it. When you practice... Good decision making in your choices, you are developing virtue in your life. You're developing the habits of making wise decisions. The same is true for the other side. If you go through the process and the pattern of making poor choices, then guess what? Those are the habits and that's the character that's developing in your life. Your character is who you are when nobody's looking. When nobody's looking at you, the decisions that you make, that shapes your character. That's who you are. And those things are, are shaped by the choices that you make day in and day out. And for Jeremiah, he was challenging his audience. God is a, is a sovereign God. He is merciful. He's just. He's merciful in that if, if you will repent, if you will turn to him, you will find forgiveness. Same is true today. Jeremiah was true, it's true today. He has given us his son so that we can be forgiven in him. We have a responsibility to repent. We have a responsibility to try to live like him. And the way that you're going to change, the way that your clay is going to be impressed, the shape of your clay, whether it's going to be marred and good for nothing, just good to be destroyed, or whether it's not going to become a beautiful piece of pottery, is being shaped every day by the decisions that you make. So my challenge to you is as you leave here and as you go to lunch period and as you go to your classes and as you go to your, to your uh, homes and you engage in social media and the like, that you think and you consider your choices. Start thinking about the daily choices that you make. And those daily choices are shaping your habits which are shaping your character. And for the glory of God, to fulfill God's glory, to, to build into his kingdom, let's make choices that honor him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness.
in our lives. And God, we pray now that uh, as you've challenged us in your word and we've seen uh, your word, the prophet Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, we pray that you will cause us to leave here changed, not to be the same people that we were when we came in. Show us areas in our lives where we're making foolish choices. And then by the power of your spirit, uh, would you enable us to make wise choices and help us to become more like Christ? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.